Cheers. Thanks a million, Luke. Uh, I'm aware that a lot of people have um, turned off their video, which is quite disconcerting for a participatory workshop. Um, and it also has a particular impact on maybe what we consider exclusion and inclusion within research and within practice. But I also appreciate that you might be eating your lunch as well. Um, I'm happy to be viewing what you're eating in your lunch if you're happy to show yourself. But if not, that's OK as well. Um, thanks a million, Luke. I'm, I'm, um, I suppose it's the first time I've been back doing online stuff in a while, which is which is kind of a little bit kind of uh, unusual for me um, coming from back face to face online. But um, uh, I'm hoping over the next hour that I can begin to hopefully enthuse or at least motivate people towards a methodology that's very relevant, uh, in my opinion, at least to anybody involved in researching humankind. Humankind in terms of the living and breeding human rather than maybe the, the, the little pieces and the little kind of uh, aspects of uh, what makes up human beings. Um, I have a, a, a hope for, the, for, for, for this thing uh, as it goes forward. I'd like to increase, if possible, people's knowledge of participatory inquiry because some of you will have a knowledge and will be coming from that uh, place. Some of you might have some interest in it, uh, and particularly in a new arena where a lot of funding, particularly European funding, requires participation uh, in order to gain funding. So, so for a lot of traditional researchers, some participation is becoming almost necessary for funding, finally, after God knows how many years. Um, I have a motivation. Um, so to be clear, with participatory inquiry and participatory methodology, context is everything, including the context of the researcher and the co-researchers. So my context is quite clear. I'm a, I'm a mental health practitioner. I'm a community activist. Uh, all of my research is in uh, community or in systems of care. Um, and I, I suppose I love research, which I suppose is unusual for some. I've been researching since I was nine, um, initially wanting to understand the world and later wanting to understand and change the world. Um, my research program uh, roughly kind of translates into transforming dialogues in mental health communities. It's a double it's a double edged sword. Transforming dialogues is to see what kind of dialogues are moving forward within society. And the second part is to then engage with those dialogues and where the communities themselves uh, are looking for a way to change them to then transform those dialogues. A necessary requirement of the research methodology or the research worldview of participatory inquiry is to transform the world of inquiry. So it's not about knowledge generation. That's purely a side effect. It's about transforming the community of research that you're researching with. Um, and as a practitioner and as an activist, this methodology particularly suits my 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 focus and the focus of of the stakeholders of the co-researchers and other community activists that I engage with. So, just really to put my motivation out there. The other thing is that um, the methodology is so huge, and it's so huge uh, in a world that's so uh, exclusive and non-inclusive in a world that's so manipulated by particular politics, by particular ways of being and thinking, um, where in, in every continent all over the world, people apply certain aspects of participatory inquiry in order to try and overcome um, systemic oppression within communities, uh, within races and within um, groups of people. So, so I'm really going to focus on what I've um kind of outlined here but also with what i consider the audience may be which may be people interested in health and social care research and maybe other practitioner research maybe some people uh pursuing academic studies so i've kind of condensed it um to focus in that kind of area in terms of participatory inquiry otherwise we could just go off on all sorts of tangents and we have at this stage less than an hour for that to happen um, so hopefully that's going to meet one my objectives and two uh, what you're hoping to get out of the work out of this session yourself. 
But just before we do that, given that this is participatory inquiry, I'm just going to break you out into a couple of breakout rooms for a second. And I'm going to ask you to just discuss amongst yourselves. Oh, I know I can see the panic there already. To discuss amongst yourselves uh, what do you know about participatory inquiry and how can you research? Um, just to get a sense of it's not just me, the PI, the principal investigator, the researcher researching onto your world. It's kind of researching with you in your world. So there is how many people here? I'm just going to break out into two groups and I'm going to only break out for five minutes. So the question is, what do we know about uh, participatory inquiry? Uh, and what do you research with participatory inquiry? Um, create two groups. Uh, okay, great. I'll join you as well. Um, okay. So just make sure you join the groups when it asks you to join. That'll be brilliant. Thanks for that. Uh, you should be seeing one slide. So I'm going to ask people to do is to just throw into the chat, not to actually necessarily come back with that, what we know about participatory inquiry and uh, what is it useful to research rather than kind of moving forward um, and having that discussion here. We can bring it in then at the discussion at the end once we throw off the slideshow, if that's okay. So are ye able to put it into the chat while I'm presenting? Oh, I can see it there, yeah. And then I'll try and pick up on that as I go along, if that's okay. Um, how did that feel? Suddenly being thrown into uh, being a co-researcher. So I can see a couple of reactions, not too many. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to just continue. So, right. So this will be uh, kind of about five, five more minutes or 10 more minutes of kind of really kind of, I suppose, I'm not going to go through all of the slides. I'm just going to go through what I think is important about this. So the key thing here is you're researching into a social system with people, not on people, uh, in that system and with social transformation, uh, a, an objective, uh, an actual aim. So a lot of traditional research, sometimes the transformation is uh, accidental um within participatory re, uh, inquiry that is the intention and it's the knowledge generation is, is is literally a side effect and i just want to go back to another reason why um this is what drives me forward i'm just looking at all those books there in the bookshelf for me when i was kind of started you know from a kind of a i suppose pre-academia but a professional research career uh when i was also a practitioner and a service provider there was all these research reports, all of these practice guidelines, all of these wonderful stories on these shelves that used to come off shelves. And one of the challenges I used to have, because my job was to implement, my job was to make change in services, etc., was that all of these were derived out of content. <laughs> So they were objective, but that's a word that only belongs within empirical research. It doesn't belong in research in the rest of the known world. Um, and empirical research has got a particular focus, it's got particular methods and methodologies. So my problem and problems of colleagues was that when you take something off a shelf derived uh, out of context, and in fact, generally derived in such a way that you decontextualize it to the extent that there's very little left of the reality of the context the research happened in, um, that it's not really helpful. And you have to manipulate it so much in order to implement the guidelines that it seems pretty pointless to have to go through those double processes. So that really drove me towards participatory inquiry, where at the end, for the little book or the little report that comes at the end of it is not only the knowledge about how to do something, it's actually the knowledge and the process about how something was done. Um, so that was kind of a principal motivator for me. Um, the extent of participation is something I want to come up with there. That often dictates the methodology or methods. So a lot of you have now been involved in, for example, PPI. So DCU has embraced PPI in health and social care research, and I'm involved in that myself as, uh, on the core project. Um, and, 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 and that often looks at, you know, the extent of involvement. Now, PPI could roughly 
uh, depending on the extent of PPI, possibly fall under participatory research. But it is not participatory research in itself. It is a different kind of, I suppose, political or a different process in itself. But per PPI does look at the extent of participation in the research process. So that might be something that most of you can relate to um, at the moment, considering that for both funding and often for ethical approval, at least within DCU, we have to maybe explore the extent of PPI involvement in our research. Um, what I like about it is it's going for together. So it's not about me. Um, it's about everybody. For those of you who are in, and I heard somebody saying during the second year of the PhD, for somebody who's in an academic pursuit, one of the heebie-jeebies about uh, it not being about me is the uncertainty of engaging in a research process that requires uh, all of the community I'm researching with to um, to for it to work. Because if it doesn't work and I've got a four-year PhD that I'm aiming for, then it might be that I don't finish my PhD in four years. But what if it does work? That would be absolutely fabulous. And it does. Um, and I remember just personally, very quickly, anecdotally, I remember my supervisor saying to me, oh, yeah, no, no, I love actual research. I love participating in research. But Liam, don't, don't, don't do it for your PhD. Um, I changed supervisors and did do it for my PhD. And I've supervised many, many master's students and some PhD students doing participatory inquiries. So for those of you considering it, yes, it's very, very doable and very, very exciting. And uh, the transformation means that not only do you get outputs from your research when you go and publish, you also get outcomes when you change the world you're researching in. Anyway, less of the mantra. Um, it's a worldview in itself. Um, it's got particularly contextual worldviews. So it's really relevant to community development. Uh, anything about transformative research. So if you think about the, this lecture series, it's a center for engaged research, which has a whole you know, broad spectrum of worldviews, including participatory inquiry. But these are some of the ones that fall under participatory inquiry. If you're looking for social change, this is where participatory inquiry comes in. Organizational development. So they're, they're big, big kind of contextual worldviews kind of underneath the overarching worldview that uh, we could consider. Why participatory? Well, traditional research methodologies and methods. The age of reason and science, 600 years of it, that was going to solve all the problems of the world, unfortunately, didn't solve any problems or very few problems and in itself caused quite a lot of problems, particularly in trying to individualize this herd we call humankind. Um, and um, really caused as many problems, particularly in my arena, um, utilizing traditional research and in particular, naming traditional research without necessarily underpinning discourse with that research misled quite a lot of us, particularly some of us would know a thing called the psychiatric paradigm. So it's a way of being and understanding the world of mental health that up until kind of um, 15 years ago was seen as a scientific methodology to uh, engage with and to treat mental illness. We now thankfully know that that paradigm, um, at least from a research point of view and an evidence point of view, is long dead. However, culturally, it's still alive and well, particularly in Ireland. And it is, for example, using participatory inquiry methods that will begin to move from the culture um, into the paradigm that's already changed. Um, traditional research methods is really about researching on, which is all very nice if I'm on a bench. Uh, not necessarily nice if I'm trying to understand the nuances of humankind and the nuances of a community I'm engaging with. Um, we're dealing with diversity. So even the notion of public, public in itself, to assume there is a public um, is, is quite challenging if you consider intersectionality alone uh, and how people, depending on how they are perceived and relate to in public, uh, will have very, very different experiences. Um, so traditional research struggles with engaging with that notion yeah, um, of such things as uh, public. Uh, it can work where other approaches don't impact. And that's really important when we look at marginalized communities, when we look at intersectionality, when we look at uh, groups and communities that are um, suspicious of academia and suspicious of people who come in and parachute themselves into a place um, and then tell people what it is they think, do, and how they should be. Um, now, 
Funding used to be difficult. Now it's uh, quite easy to get funding with participatory research. So a lot of people are engaging in it. Um, that kind of speaks for itself, I hope. So over, over a long period of working uh, in participatory inquiry, in particular participatory um, action orientated um, uh, research, this is kind of, I suppose, the conceptual framework that seems to relate. Um, so we're trying to create a reflective, communicative and transformative space. So the communicative space arguably was where I put you in the breakout room. Then if we came back together and we broke out again and we explored what we talked about uh, and we looked at through a process of ongoing dialogue and agreeing on methods that we would employ to change the system that we're in, we would end up in a transformative space using communicative uh, conversations to be able to make that transformation happen. So open dialogue is one of the methods that we would use. Critical reflection, uh, a requirement. Thinking together as you did in the breakout rooms a requirement. All of these kind of uh, initial outlier boxes are out of sync with most traditional uh, research methodologies, um, but completely in sync with people being authors of their own destiny in terms of researching their uh, existing place in the world in order to transform that place for the future. It's all based on relational knowing and, and relational coming together. Um, there are certain things that have a major impact on that resistance, resistance to uh, research that might be transformatory as opposed to static, resistance to change, uh, a kind of a, an in an inbuilt um, kind of um, notion that the status quo is better than taking a chance. Um, power relations are, are a major significant element. So, for example, with the more traditional areas of research, it allows academia to carry a kind of a supreme knowledge base above other kind of knowledge bases, for example, a community knowledge base. So where power lies is very, very important within kind of the research arena and what happens to that research. So power is alive and well within participatory action and it's explored and it's placed and it's, it's, it's talked about and engaged with from the outset. Role boundaries. Researcher role boundaries, co-researcher, kind of facilitator, um, who will end up getting, for example, the report, who gets the funding, who influences the questions, all of that is very relevant. And what constitutes knowledge? So once you research with others, it's no longer the knowledge simply of the literature review or the knowledge of the expert academic. It's the community knowledge, for example, and it's the construction of a systemic knowledge, um, which will ultimately construct a systemic change as well. So, so that's roughly kind of speaking, the kind of conceptual framework that's that's kind of been evolving, certainly for me, um, and relates to a lot of the participatory uh, approaches. Um, just briefly remembering participation, a lot of people consider the, the Wondersman kind of definition of participation. And when they consider that, then that's very, very lukewarm. It's very, very diluted. It doesn't really look like people are participating at all, other than maybe a little bit of consultation, a little bit of, oh, yeah, just involved. A little bit like tokenistic involvement of service users, uh, which, for example, some PPI engages with. And in, in, in several health and social care discourses, there's a tokenistic involvement. That's not the participation we talk about in participation inquiry, but it's often what people refer to. What we more likely refer to is the notion of a humanistic and communicative approach to a participation. For example, Weber and Tuller's um, definition, where there needs to be an opportunity for sustained deliberation. All parties need to be there and the minority voice needs to be carried along with the majority voice as with deliberate democracy. And there's power sharing in the decision making. Not that the whole community makes the decisions, but that the community engages with the decision makers and agrees where and how the decisions will be made. Um, in contrast to the more traditional or the more bureaucratic approach, it's about efficiency, economy and cost effectiveness, which is sometimes great for the funders, sometimes great for the researchers, um, and very seldom great for the people where the inquiry is being contextualized. It will often involve quite a lot of disagreement. 
Um, uh, and uh, the kind of the dialogical approach that's used in both methods and methodology um, enables that kind of disagreement. Um, it looks at process uh, more than outputs, um, although there are outputs and there are um, uh, outcomes, and the process needs to be um, auditable and followable and transparent in order for all within the community to, to feel they're participating in it. Uh, all that want to participate. So more examples that might make more sense in terms of the kind of thing that's read in books. So participatory action research. For a lot of people, I, I think I heard a few teachers in, in the room there, participate action research is very, very um, uh, relevant to, to, to that um, area. Emancipatory action research, particularly relevant to intersectionality work community and community development work. Um, Self-help communities, where participatory action research enables the communities themselves to determine their own destiny and their own knowledge base. Uh, in practice development for health and social care, for teaching, for, for all sorts of practice, practice disciplines and management also. The rest kind of speaks for itself. Um, it's pluralistic. So it kind of really will upset um research kind of methodologies that comes from a very kind of uh, i suppose narrow and particular viewpoint who would argue that objectivity uh is 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 particularly relevant and to come to a kind of empirical truth is necessary and um, where participatory methodologies for for one looks pluralistically and doesn't recognize that there is one truth there are truths um, uh, and there are truths that are already there and there are truths that can be created. So that pluralism is very, very helpful and relevant to uh, communities that are not, um, um, you know, uh, what, what we say. So intersectionality um, in itself, the pluralism associated with that uh, is quite applicable for participating methodologies. Um, it looks for the most um, utilizable method and a utilizable approach um to answer the questions that are raised by the community um some of the underpinning theories are critical theory so critical theory as some of you will know is looking at what lies beneath um so it's engaging with systems and looking beneath and saying right what is actually driving this it's a lot of it's based on power communicate uh, communication theory so open dialogue as a way of engaging all of the people where and how they want to be engaged in the actual process itself. Pragmatism, the notion that um, there are several ways of getting from A to B, and the most practical and pragmatic way of getting to B uh, is, 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 is the best way to go. Um, and that underpins quite a lot of, of, of well, with many methodologies, but in particular coming into the participatory methodologies, because it allows for multiple, multiple truths. Social constructionism, so in my own field, we have from about uh, 1897 uh, and late, laterally in 1912 managed to construct uh, an entire community, community called psychiatry, um, through a social constructionist kind of methodology. And now we're presently trying to deconstruct that through the same kind of methodologies. Uh, participatory research spoke about systems theory, um, et cetera. So they may be more kind of theoretically, they may, people may kind of, I suppose, relate to those. It's different for us. <laughs> um, there are many debates. <clears throat> um, you know, even the one I'll just debate briefly is um, the notion that evidence-based practice um, is valueless. Uh, the notion that um, uh, objectivity is not politically driven. All of these notions, you know, within the literature and within research and within discourse have all been, um, I suppose, displaced. Evidence-based practice is political more than an empirical, factual kind of uh, uh, methodology. Uh, there's a debate around that. Uh, as I said earlier on, your objectivity lies within one way of knowing, the empirical way of knowing. Outside of that, it doesn't really have a place. Um, so there are many debate, debates in terms of generalizability, no, of course you can't generalize a contextually based piece of research that transforms that community. You could generalize the process if it managed to have worked and generalize the methodology and the approach, not the actual findings, because the findings belong to that community. 
people have ethical concerns, and I suppose the main response to the ethical ethical concerns about bias, uh, ethical concerns about insider outsider, uh, ethical concerns about how can be a researcher and embed in a community at the same time. How can you be a co researcher when you're not trained? Lots of these kind of concerns, and I suppose the 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 counter concern the counter balance to that in terms of validity in terms of uh, virtuous ethics is that if the whole community are involved or have the opportunity to be involved uh, rather than um uh, a, a kind of a, a managed controlled approach to anomalizing so much of what happens in the community then the validity at least the face validity and content validity of participatory inquiry is so much more valid than a a, a process that seeks to anomalize people's experiences and characteristics so so there's quite a long strong argument against and within some of those debates between participatory versus in particular traditional empirical research um okay uh i suppose i'm going to pause for a second and just look in the chat um oh okay you're not very chatty you were very chatty in the breakout rooms uh, so I can't comment on anything at the moment because you haven't you haven't put anything in there. So maybe throw something in if you don't mind, so I can I can at least respond and we can all respond to each other. Um, but meanwhile, I'll just kind of push on, and then um, I do have a cunning plan that if you don't engage, I have another breakout exercise towards the end. Um, but we'll see we'll see where we go. Um, 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 a lot of people, and this includes uh, me, my colleagues, and researchers. Um, comfort zones are really, really important. And if I can do a piece of research, that means I can sit in my office or sit in my lab and maybe get a PhD student and maybe kind of do a really lovely piece of research on the community that makes it kind of nice and tidy um, and will come up with some really good findings. And I am a really good um, writer where I can get many, many, many publications out of my research. That is very comfortable. And that allows me to be a very comfortably placed academic. It allows me to have a career. Uh, and why shouldn't I? Uh, no reason why not. Um, so that, that is one argument. Um, but participatory inquiry is not for that branch of the industry. It is messy. Um, it is fun. It's exciting. You do get dirty. And doesn't matter whether you're a PI or multi-million quid, the chances are you're going to have to get down and dirty in the community if you're generally doing the research in the first instance. So my own example at the moment is I'm in one national participatory inquiry, I'm one international participatory inquiry at the moment. I'm in several, but just two are coming to mind at the moment. Uh, and in both cases, I'm down and dirty for want of a better word and loving it and wouldn't change it for the world. Um, uh, and just about keeping the plants in my office alive because I don't spend very much time in my office. Um, but as I said, participatory inquiry is for some and not for others. Some practice and organizational approaches. Action research is one that most people can relate to. Um, so some of the emancipatory research, Freire, um, you know, I, I, I suppose the key thing, again, this would come for a lot of, I think, uh, a lot of the kind of people involved in teaching in, 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 in this session is the notion of overcoming oppression through emancipatory research. And, and there's been quite a lot written about that and quite a lot of people use that research, including myself. Um, and uh, it's evolved into lots of other kind of approaches. Um, participatory research spoke about cooperative uh, inquiry. Um, appreciative inquiry is really helpful when we're engaging in communities where there's a lot of criticism, where there's been a lot of oppression and where we work towards a preferred destiny rather than just spend all of our time criticizing what happened in the past. I know practical in inquiry is something that's particularly relevant to myself as a practitioner and maybe relevant to some of you as well. It's where you look at practical theory and through your own engagement in practical theory um, and in looking to change practice through examining the hypothesis in real time within practice that you can move uh, the practical theory onwards. So that's a real live kind of changing uh, way of engaging as a practitioner with hypothesis testing and hypothesis changing as you go. Uh, and for a lot of practitioners, that's both exciting and, and interesting. Open dialogic approaches is one that I've particularly engaged in and myself and some colleagues have written about this quite a lot. So I won't, you know, it can, we can be found wherever you want to kind of Google or, or 
or find the approaches and open dialogue. And this is about using communicative theory, uh, about com communication theory to ensure that you're engaged in a deliberate attempt to have as many voices and all kinds of voices engaged in the process, not only the process of the research itself, but using it as a method within the process. Uh, and there's all sorts of different ways of doing that. Um, sorry, I'm just going to look at chat here for a second. Um, oh, thank you. I'll try and engage with that question in a minute, Chris. Thank you. Um, Okay, so there's the kind of, I suppose, the medium of a lot of what drives, certainly my program of research, but, but quite a lot of other um, people engaged in citizen engagement and engaged in citizen research, um, which is looking to change the status quo for citizens. So it kind of speaks to itself. Crucially, it's subject to subject, not object to subject. A major difference. It's about co-creating a new possibility uh, and naming that new possibility. Um, it doesn't require abandoning in beliefs. It doesn't require being brainwashed or anything like that. You can still engage completely within your own beliefs, within your own system. But once you engage collectively, it's no longer about the I, it's about the we. And if we consider the notion of Ubuntu, I am because we are, and we are a human herd. That's innately what drives the human, the human species. Then that co-creation seems to make more sense to me um than trying to separate me from the herd um uh, the process is the pathway to the truth rather than the questionnaire for example just a couple of examples in there just as i stop to breathe and to try and look at this question yeah no i think that was a comment really uh from from chris in that thanks for that chris and if anybody else wants to add uh, oh yeah yeah, more ecologically valid research. Thank you. The real experiences, particularly for marginalized. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that, Lorna. Uh, um, uh, there's a question about Geraldine. I think that's a really good question. And in fact, uh, um, it, it, sometimes it's something uh, I, I come up against it. So I'm technically a senior academic. Um, I've, I've not, not quite at the most senior or anything like that, but a senior academic. And yes, I publish, uh, but I publish minimally. I publish just enough to be considered as somebody who publishes. Um, and so it's not that it's difficult to publish. I think the challenge is not about it's difficult to publish. There's loads of journals will publish. Um, it is, well, one, getting through our ethics committee with participatory inquiry is, is challenging, but it, but, but, but it can be done. But there's more of the doing and the focus is on outcomes, not outputs. So in academia, we focus on outputs quite a lot, which is essentially the publications. Um, I know there's lots of other outputs, you know, journal, you know, true journals, et cetera, are true the news, et cetera. But essentially you're measured against publication outputs. Um, but when you're doing participatory inquiry, you're measuring yourself about whether you have been involved in a transformatory process. That takes a lot of work. Even after the project, you're often still engaged in that. So the outcomes are more relevant than the outputs for you as a researcher often. So sometimes the time given over to uh, journal writing, for example, is really spent on creating and co-creating outcomes. And, and for some, depending on your, 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 your direction in, 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 in working life, that might be something you decide, okay, I'm willing not to publish quite a lot um, uh, and to focus instead on the outcomes. It really depends on where you're coming from. Doing a little bit of both probably works. I know people in the participatory inquiry world who publish constantly, you know, um, so it can and, it, and it's done. So I'm, I think the difficulty is more about where you focus your your um, you focus your effort rather than the ability to actually publish. I don't know if that makes sense, Geraldine. Um, um, but certainly I've, um, I, I've I've had to reflect on uh, why I publish less than some of my academic colleagues. And once I reflect on it and I take it from my head, uh, and from my HR kind of consciousness down into my belly, uh, I then realize I don't give, I don't care. I'm more focused on outcomes. Um, and at some stage, someplace, somewhere, um, uh, that might be appreciated within the academic settings as well. Here's um, a kind of a notion here about dialogical approaches to participatory inquiry. Again, remember, I'm focusing 
you know, some people, for example, would talk about, uh, well, dialogical approaches aren't necessarily the same if you go down into the global south. Um, uh, where people would dialogue much more through kind of uh, activity, through engagement, through body, through movement, through performance. But as I said earlier on, I'm trying to kind of work with where I think most of us might be researching, which probably is Western Northern Hemisphere just at the moment for a lot of us. And that's why I'm, I'm particularly focused on the dialogical approach here. I don't really want to pull anything out of that other than... No, I think it speaks for itself. As a researcher, if you look at this, though, as a researcher, there's kind of three things when you engage in this. Often researchers, uh, we're, 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 we're quite, we quite like our approaches, and you probably already gathered my passion and my approach. I think it's much better than another approach. And that'll be the same for any researcher, wherever they're coming from. So often we feel really quite strong and we feel we're very knowledgeable. And so we should be. We spend a long time studying our methodologies. Um, but when you move into participatory inquiry, you have to be willing to give up willing to kind of recognize that your knowledge is not necessarily the knowledge that's going to drive this forward. So kind of you also have to reduce the power. You have to kind of go down in your seat. You have to kind of be in a circle of friends or circle of colleagues. You're no longer the top table person being the expert kind of delivering. Um, and you have to maybe enter that kind of uncertain fear place where I don't know what's going to happen when we start this process. And that can be quite fearful for people as well. And for those who are in that zone, it's actually, that's really probably what drives us, is actually jumping into the uncertain fear and not knowing what's going to happen. Where would you use it? Well, I've used it quite a lot, and so have a lot of other people, improving a community mental health service, for example, or any other health service or social care service, perfect at systems level. Because you integrate, you 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 get involved and you move into the system at all of the levels in order to change it. And for those of you working in any institutions, including DCU, you know that the underbelly culture is the thing that really drives the system. The rest of it is often just PR and just kind of you know the tip of the iceberg above the kind of the really really gritty stuff. So participatory inquiry for that kind of systems level change really really works because you go into the underbelly of the iceberg. Um, whoops. At a group level, sorry, oh no, okay for time, I think. So at a group level, for example, when we're looking particular marginalization, so looking at, for example, stigma, um, I'm just gonna use one example. Stigma is something um, that people have tried to get their heads around for a long time. And we've got lots of places where stigma has been tackled. Now this is stigma for anything. It could be kind of stigma for me, stigma around mental health, stigma around substance use, stigma around having particular physical illnesses and being judged because of that. Sickle cell comes to mind, for example. Uh, uh, stigma because you might be slow at school, you know, all sorts of reasons that come from particular families, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really difficult to get at that, of course, we can do, you know, big studies. We've done a big national study ourselves, which kind of copied 21 other countries. Um, and, and, and we came up with similar findings. But yes, people are stigmatized, people are discriminated against, but it didn't work out how to actually solve it. And people have been trying to solve it for a long time. In mental health, for example, we have this thing called sea change. Um, it's been around for a long time. And so far, all of the kind of surveys or all of the evaluations to see has stigma changed within the Irish kind of system in relation to stigma and discrimination? No, no, it hasn't. And what we've done is we've mimicked, for example, the UK. In the UK, they spend 30 million uh, per year trying to tackle stigma on the basis of a traditional study. And every time they looked at it, did they make it any better? Uh, uh, in fact, stigma was on the increase and discrimination was the increase. We only spent 13 million um, and the same kind of results are that stigma is on the increase and discrimination is on the increase. However, using participatory inquiry through establishing of the Trilog Network in Ireland in 2011, uh, one of the findings that we found in our publication uh, output, there you go, there's an output, um, in, uh, in 2018, was that using Trilog, which is the dialogical community-based forum, will and can reduce stigma in communities. One of the few places I've seen, and I've been studying stigma for quite a long time, where mental health stigma can be overcome. So really looking at kind of marginalization, uh, participatory will work and can work and does work. Um, community capacity building. Um, 
uh, works really, really well. At the dyad level, oh, what is that there? Basically at the level of practice. So um, where people are working, so maybe for example, in psychotherapy, for example, in nursing and social care, in occupational therapy and psychology, in these kind of areas in teaching, where you're looking at the interrelationships between, you know, the practitioners and the people that the practice is supposed to be impacting on. If you create that kind of dyad relationship and we set into that, it comes up with some really, really good results. I've ended up um, um, ahead of time. So um, I just want to remind us, because a lot of people have over the years said, but they won't fund PI, uh, participate inquiry. Yes, they will. And yes, they do. Um, and uh, I have, um, uh, I can personally vouch for that, but also anybody who's looking at European funding, Horizon 2020 funding, Horizon Europe funding, will see that actually it's a requirement now to have citizen engagement in the research process. So they will fund, uh, and they'll also fund without it, but they'll definitely fund it. I myself have six-figure funding for participatory inquiry, so there's no doubt it, they do and will fund it at national and international levels, because um, that used to be an argument why people didn't go for funding. Uh, is it for you? Let's find out. I'm going to break you out again, just for five minutes. What, if anything, transformed in how you, as individuals or groups, view or experience participatory inquiry? um as a result of that very fast spiel uh and the conversation you had earlier on in this conversation so i'm going to stop share for a second i'm going to break you out oh we're a bigger group no same size groups i'm going to break you out in two groups uh, yeah and, and also just to say that within participatory inquiry there's a place for quantitative as well there's a place for whatever works. So, so just to, to keep that in the mix. Yeah, often you have specific findings. And then if you want, for example, to engage with the community saying, this is how you answer this, but asking them to contextualize it and mm. to kind of uh, to put a cultural kind of imprint on what it might mean in relation to them, because you'll have answered it probably. I think yeah, I heard you yeah. said earlier on that the questionnaire was derived outside of the cultural kind of arena where you're now using it. So you might be able to, from your point of view, say, this is how it was created this is the answers it gave me how does that what does that mean for you as a community group so you could that's how you could take it there for a further interpretation um, okay yeah yeah, yeah brilliant uh, and, and it brings you know uh, an extra authenticity to the findings yeah it would be more meaningful at least to the community you're hoping to influence okay yeah br no brilliant thanks very much cheers Lorna. and anybody else uh, any any thoughts yeah, there's nobody and there's nobody else on the chat. I have a question. It was on the chat, but you yeah, unfortunately can't see it. Um, just a, a quick question about um, if you're using this for inquiry, uh, for a a longitudinal a longitudinal study or something over a long period of time, do you um do you find it difficult maybe to engage the subject or individuals or community groups over a long period of time, and also then, yeah, can there be a, a change of heart or like a a, a, a re-deciding re of when the study actually ends or what extent the study actually um the extent that it can be taken yeah. um do you find that that is difficult or and you have to kind of re-gauge how far you can go with a particular goal or ambition so there's there's, there's, a, there's a few questions you know i suppose the first one is the possibility of long-term longitudinal kind of you know a research and that the initial, the, the first answer to that is that it's possible for that to go on constantly, cycle after cycle after cycle, because it's not about engaging. You don't have to hold on to the same sample group like you would in an empirical longitudinal study, because you're working with the process and you're working with the community or the system you're engaging with. So it's not like I need to hold on to the exact same people. I need to be, I need to actually work with that same community because people grow communities grow systems grow so you're working with that growing community growing people rather than with um you know the individual samples that allows it for to go on forever i put in the chat there an example was a 10-year study we did here in dcu with mental health services around ireland it lasts from 2007 to 2016 so that's quite a long study um yeah and you're not you're not looking at a pre and post it's not that kind of you're looking what happens during the ensuing time and what changed over time so there'll be process outcomes you'll move from 
a non-dialogically based mental health service in some cases to uh, dialogically based. So you're getting kind of process outcomes as well as actual outcomes along the line. So, so that would answer that in terms of, and, and it is very interesting, particularly if you're doing it for an academic study, in terms of when does it end? When do you decide it ends? And so, because often what you're trying to do, particularly with funding, is you're trying to ensure sustainability, not ending. Um, so, an example would be that you might decide uh, for the purpose of the funding or for the purpose of an academic kind of uh, a journey, you would decide that there will be a point in time when it's okay to end, you know, maybe at the end of a research, one of the cycles of actual research, if it was actual research, maybe when you have, you know, identified a certain time in the process that you were looking to, uh, outcomes or deliverables you're looking to achieve, and you will check out in terms of the academic piece or in terms of the report findings then, but there's always ends in view, because you've you've kickstarted a transformative process. Usually you can't stop it. The transformative process changes, goes other places, slows down, sometimes dies, revives, sometimes it comes down here and it goes out there. Um, so you have to make a call on that and something that's determined by funding, by time frame, or by your academic studies. Um, uh, sometimes there's a clusterfuck and it just goes completely all over the place and it kind of almost implodes upon itself. That happens as well. That's that's the reality of, of, of kind of engaged community participatory research. Excuse my language. Uh, um, I don't know where we can delete that in the recording. Um, all right, that's excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add or a last minute question? I see we got some thanks from Mary and Chris. Uh, thank you very much. But anyone else just before we finish? Yeah, thanks for those who were able to stay on. Um, and good luck with the funding, uh, Elena. In the humanities, I, I do know it can be challenging. Thank you, Liam. I mean, I'm sorted out uh, for now, but yeah, thanks for the future <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, All right, I think we'll we'll finish up there. Everyone's sending in their thanks. Thank you. Well, thank uh, you. on behalf of the yes. Centre for Guys Research, thanks to Millie and Liam. Uh, that was fascinating. Uh, and I hope to talk to you about it again. Lovely. Thank thanks, Lou. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Thank you.